Hey, time for chapter three of Finn Family Moomin Troll, which was written and illustrated by Duv Janssen and which is published by Puffin. Thank you, Puffin. Chapter three, in which the muskrat has a terrible experience. How the Moomin family discover Hattie Fattener's island, where the Hemulin has a narrow escape and how they survive the great thunderstorm. Next morning, the muskrat went out as usual with his book to lie in the hammock. But he just got comfortable when the string broke and he found himself on the ground. Unpardonable! exclaimed the muskrat, unwinding the rug from his legs. Oh dear, said Moomin Papa, who was watering his tobacco plants. I hope you didn't hurt yourself. It isn't that, replied the muskrat, gloomily sucking his moustache. The earth can crack and fire come down from heaven for all I care. That sort of thing doesn't disturb me. But I do not like to be put in a ridiculous situation. It isn't dignified for a philosopher. But I'm the only one who saw it happen, protested Moomin Papa. Well, that's bad enough, replied the muskrat. You will remember all that I've been exposed to in your house. Last year, for example, a comet fell on us. It was nothing. <laughs> but as you perhaps remember, I sat on your wife's chocolate shape. It was the deepest insult to my indignity. And sometimes your guests put hairbrushes in my bed. A particularly stupid joke, not to mention your son, Moomin Troll. I know, I know, interrupted Moomin Papa miserably. But there's no peace in this house. Sometimes string wears out with the years, you know. But it must not, said the muskrat. If I had killed myself, of course, it, it wouldn't have mattered. But imagine if your young persons had seen me. Now, however, I intend to retire to a deserted spot. and live a life of loneliness and peace, giving up everything. I have made up my mind once and for all. Moomin Papa was impressed. Oh, he said. Well, where, where will you go? To the cave, said the muskrat. Nobody can interrupt my thoughts with stupid jokes there. You may bring me food twice a day, but not before ten o'clock. Good, said Moomin Papa, bowing. And shall we bring you some furniture too? Yes, you can do that, said the muskrat more kindly. But very simple things. I realise you mean well, but that family of yours is really too much for me. So the muskrat took his book and his rug and wandered slowly off towards the cliffs. Moomin Papa sighed to himself, and then he went on watering his tobacco plants and soon forgot all about it. When the muskrat arrived in the cave, he was very pleased with everything, and he spread his rug out on the sandy floor, and he sat down on it, and he began at once to think. He continued to do that for about two hours. All was quiet and peaceful, and through the crack in the roof, the sun shone softly into his hiding place. Sometimes he moved slightly when the sun slid away from him. Here I shall stay forever and ever, he thought. How unnecessary it is to run about and to chatter, and to build a house and cook food and collect possessions. He looked contentedly around at his new home. Then he caught sight of the hobgoblin's hat, which Moomin Troll and Snufkin had hidden in the darkest corner. The waste paper basket, said the muskrat to himself. Oh, so it's here. Well, it'll come in useful. He thought for a little while longer, then he decided to sleep for a bit. He rolled himself in the blanket and he put his false teeth into the hat so that they would not get sandy. And then he slept peacefully and happily. In the Moomin house, they had pancakes for luncheon. Big yellow pancakes with raspberry jam. There was porridge from the day before as well, but as nobody wanted it, they decided to save it for the next morning. Today, I feel like doing something unusual, said Moomin Mother. The fact that we got rid of that awful hat is something that should be celebrated. Besides, one gets so tired of everlastingly sitting in the same place. That's quite true, my dear, said Moomin Papa. We'll go on an excursion somewhere, what? 
We've been everywhere already. There isn't anywhere new, said the Hemelin. But there must be, said Moomin Papa. And if there isn't, then we will make somewhere. Stop eating now, children. We'll, we'll take the food with us. Can we eat what we already have in our mouths? asked Sniff. Don't be silly, dear, said Moomin Mama. Collect everything you want to take with you quickly, as your father wants to start at once. But don't take anything unnecessary. We can write a note to the muskrat so he knows where we are. Oh, bless my tail, burst out Moomin Papa, and he put his hand up to his forehead. I'd completely forgotten. We should have taken food and furniture to him in the cave. In the cave, screamed Moomin Troll and Snuffkin at the same time. Yes, the string of the hammock gave out, said Moomin Papa. So the muskrat said he couldn't think any more and he'd have to give up everything. You'd put brushes in his bed and I, I don't know what. And anyway, he went to the cave. Moomin, Troll and Snuffkin went very pale and they looked at each other in horror. The hat, they thought. Well, it doesn't matter very much, said Moomin Mama. We'll go on an excursion to the beach and we'll take the muskrat's food to him on the way. The beach is so ordinary, grumbled Sniff. Can't we go somewhere else? Be quiet, children, said Moomin Papa severely. Mama wants to bathe. Now come along, Moomin Mama hurried off to pack. She collected blankets, saucepans, birch bark. Um, birch bark is the best thing for starting a fire. You must be prepared for any emergency on an excursion. Um, a coffee pot, masses of food, suntan oil, matches and everything you can eat out of, on or with. She packed it all with an umbrella, warm clothes, tummy ache medicine, an egg whisk, cushions and mosquito net bathing drawers and a tablecloth in her bag. She bustled to and fro, racking her brains for anything she'd forgotten. And at last she said, now it's ready. Oh, how lovely it'll be to have a rest by the sea. Moomin Papa packed his pipe and his fishing rod. Well, are you ready? He asked. You sure you haven't forgotten anything? All right, let's start. And they set off in a procession towards the beach. Last of all came Sniff, dragging six little toy boats behind him. Do you think the muskrat has got up to anything? Whispered Moomin Troll to Snuffkin. I certainly hope not, Snuffkin whispered back, but I'm feeling... A little bit anxious. At that moment they all stopped so suddenly that the Hemelin nearly got the fishing rod in his eye. Who screamed? Moomin Mama burst out in alarm. The whole wood shook with a wild howling and then someone or something came galloping towards them on the path growling with terror and rage. Hide! shouted Moomin Papa. There's a monster coming! But before anyone had time to move the monster turned out to be the muskrat, with staring eyes and bristling whiskers. He waved his paws and made incoherent sounds that nobody could understand. But it was clear that he was very angry or frightened, or angry because he was frightened. And then he turned tail and fled. What has happened to the muskrat? said Moomin Mama anxiously. He was always so calm and dignified. To get into such a state just because the hammock cord broke, said Moomin Papa, shaking his head. I think he was angry because we forgot to take food to him, said Sniff. Now we can eat it ourselves. They continued their way to the beach, a bit disturbed in their thoughts, but Moomin Troll and Snuffkin sneaked off in front of others and took a shortcut to the cave. We don't go in through the door. Perhaps the thing is still there, said Snuffkin. We'll climb on top and look down through the crack in the roof. Quietly. They crawled up, worming their way like like uh, red Indians towards the opening in the roof, and then they looked down into the cave. There stood the hobgoblin's hat, and it was empty. The rug was thrown in one corner, the book in another. The cave was deserted, but in the sand, strange footprints could be seen, as if someone had been dancing and jumping about. It wasn't. The muskrat's paws that made those footprints, said Moomin Troll. I wonder if it was some other paws, said Snuffkin. It looks awfully queer. They clambered down again and looked nervously around. But nothing alarming happened. They never found out what had frightened the muskrat so terribly, because he refused to talk about it. Uh, if you want to find out what the muskrat's false teeth had turned into, you can ask your mama. She's sure to know. But meanwhile, the others had arrived on the beach. They all stood in a bunch down by the water's edge, chattering and waving their arms. 
They found a boat, cried Snuffkin. Come on, let's run and see. Uh, and it was true. A lovely big sailing boat, complete with oars and fishing tackle and painted in white and mauve. Whose is it? panted Moomin Troll when he'd reached them. Nobody's, said Moomin Papa triumphantly. It has been washed up on the beach, so we have the right to keep it as wreckage. It must have a name, said the Snork Maiden. Wouldn't the Peewit be rather sweet? Peewit yourself, said the Snork rudely. I prefer the Sea Eagle. No, no, it must be Latin, cried the Hemulin. Muminates Maritima. I saw it first, squeaked Sniff. I must choose a name. Wouldn't it be fun to call it Sniff? That's so short and sweet. <laughs> Just like you, I don't think, said Moomin Troll jeeringly. Oh, hush, children, said Moomin Papa. Quiet, quiet. Obviously, Mama will choose the name. It's her excursion. Moomin Mama blushed a little. Oh, if only I could, she said shyly. Snuffkin has such an imagination. I'm sure that he'll choose much better. Snuffkin was rather flattered. Well, I, I don't know, he said, but to tell the truth, I thought from the beginning that Lurking Wolf would be rather nice. Get away with you, said Moomin Troll. Mother shall choose. Yes, dears, said Moomin Mama, only you mustn't think I'm stupid and old-fashioned. But I rather think the boat should be called something to remind us all of what we're going to do with her. So I think The Adventure would be a good name. Marvellous, said Moomin Troll. We'll christen her. Have you got anything we can use for a bottle of champagne, Mother? Moomin Mama hunted in all her baskets for a bottle of raspberry juice. Oh dear, how sad, she burst out. I think that I've forgotten the raspberry juice. Well, I asked if you had everything, didn't I, my dear, said Moomin Papa, virtuously. They all looked at each other sadly. To sail away in a boat that hasn't been properly christened can mean the worst possible luck. Then Moomin Troll had a brilliant idea. Give me a saucepan, he said, and then he filled it up with sea water. He carried it up to the cave and to the hobgoblin's hat. When he came back, he handed some raspberry juice to his father and said, taste this. Moomin Papa took a gulp and looked very pleased. Where did you get this from, my boy, he asked. But Moomin Troll said that it was a secret. So they filled a bottle with the juice and broke it against the prow of the sailing boat, while Moomin Mama proudly proclaimed, Herewith I christen you now and forever the adventure! And everybody cheered. And then they put the baskets, blankets, umbrella, fishing rod, cushions, saucepans and bathing suits on board, and the Moomin family and their friends set sail for the wild green sea. It was a fine day. Perhaps not quite clear because a gold haze lay over the sun. But the adventure spread her white sails and headed out to sea at a good speed. The waves slapped the sides of the boat and the wind sang and mermaids and mermen danced around the bows and big white birds circled up above. Sniff had tied his six little boats in a line one after the other and now the whole fleet sailed in the adventure's wake. Moomy Papa steered and Moomy Mama sat dozing. It was seldom she had such peace around her. Where shall we go? asked the Snork. Uh, Let's go to an island, snorked, uh, begged the Snork Maiden. I've never been to a little island before. You shall do it now, said Moomy Papa. We'll land on the first island we see. Moomy Troll was sitting furthest up in the bows, keeping a lookout for reefs. It was so wonderful to stare down into the green depth and to watch the adventure's prow cutting through the white foam. Pee-hoo! shouted Moomin Troll. We're going to an island! Far out to sea lay the Hattifatna's lonely island, surrounded by reefs and breakers. Once a year, the Hattifatna's collect there before setting out on their endless foraging expedition around the world. They come from all points of the compass, silent, and serious with their small, white, empty faces. And why they hold this yearly meeting, it is difficult to say, as they can neither hear nor speak, and have no object in life but the distant goal of a journey's end. Perhaps they like to have a place where they feel at home and can have rest a little and meet friends. The yearly meeting is always in June, and thus it was that the Moomin family and the Hattifatners arrived on the lonely island at around the same time. 
wild and tempting it rose from the sea, wreathed in white breakers, crowned with green trees, as if dressed for a gala. Land ahead, shouted Moomin Troll, and they all hung over the rail to look. There's a sandy beach, cried the snort maiden, and a fine harbour, cried Moomin Papa, steering skilfully into land between the reefs. The adventure ran deep into the sand, and Moomin Troll jumped ashore with the painter. The beach was soon seething with activity. Moomin Mama dragged up some stones to make a fireplace to warm up the pancakes. She collected wood and spread out the tablecloth with a little stone on each corner to stop it blowing away. And she put out all the cups and sank the butter jar in the wet sand in the shade of a stone. Finally, she arranged a bouquet of beech lilies in the middle of the table. Can we help with anything? asked Moomin Troll when everything was ready. You can explore the island, said Moomin Mama. Who knew that was what they were longing to do anyway? It's important to know where we've landed. It could be dangerous, couldn't it? Exactly, said Moomin Troll. And off he went with the Snork Maiden and her brother and Sniff towards the south shore. While Snufkin, who preferred to, to discover things alone, set off for the north. The Hemulin took his botanising spade, his green collecting tin and his magnifying glass and wandered into the wood. He thought he might find some wonderful vegetation that nobody had yet discovered. Meanwhile, Moomin Papa sat down on a stone to fish. And the sun sank slowly down while the golden haze blotted out the sea. In the middle of the island lay a green glade with a smooth floor surrounded by flowering shrubs. Here the Hattifatners had their secret meeting place where they foraged once a year at midsummer. About three hundred of them had already found their way there and at least four hundred more were expected. In the middle of the glade they had put up a high pole, painted blue, and on this hung a barometer. They skimmed silently over the grass, bowing haughtily to each other, and every time they passed the barometer they bowed deeply to it. This looked a bit ridiculous. All this time the Hemulin was rambling about in the wood, enraptured by the masses of rare flowers. They were not at all like the flowers that grew in Moomin Valley. Oh, far from it. Heavy, silvery white clusters which looked like they were made of glass. Crimson black king cups like royal crowns and sky blue roses. But the Hemulin didn't see much of their beauty. He was too busy counting the stamens and leaves and muttering to himself, This is the 219th specimen in my collection. Eventually he reached the Hattifatna's hideout and he walked into it, peering eagerly around for rare specimens. He didn't look up much until he bumped into the blue pole, which startled him very much. He'd never in his life seen so many Hattie Fatners. They swarmed over everything and their pale little eyes stared through him. I wonder if they're in a bad temper, the Hemulin thought to himself. They're small, but there's horribly many of them. He looked at the big shiny mahogany barometer. It stood at rain and wind. Extraordinary, said the Hemulin, blinking at the sunshine. Then he tapped the barometer, which sank quite a bit. And then the Hattie Fatners rustled threateningly and they took a step towards him. Hey, it's all right, he said in alarm. I won't take your barometer. But the Hattie Fatners didn't hear him. They just came nearer, rustling and waving their hands. The Hemulin, with his heart in his mouth, watched for an opportunity to make his escape. But the enemy stood like a wall around him and always came nearer. And between the trees came still more Hattie Fatners with their staring eyes and their silent tread. Go away! screamed the Hemulin. Shoo! Shoo! But still they came silently nearer. And then the Hemulin picked up his skirts and began to climb up the pole. It was nasty and slippery, but terror gave him unhemulinish strength. And at last he reached the top and got hold of the barometer. And the Hattifatners had now reached the foot of the pole and there they waited. The whole glade was thick with them, like a white carpet. The Hemulin felt quite ill when he thought of what would happen if he fell down. Help! He yelled at the top of his voice. Help! Help! But the wood was silent. Then he stuck two fingers in his mouth and he whistled. Three short, three long, three short. S-O-S. -S. Snuffkin who had wandered along the beach, heard the Hemulin's signal of distress and lifted his head to listen. 
When he got the direction clear, dashed to the rescue. The call became louder and Snufkin, realising that now it was quite near, crept cautiously forward. It became lighter between the trees and there he saw the glade, the heady fatteners and the hemulin clutching on tightly to the pole. This is a terrible situation, he muttered to himself and then louder to the hemulin. Hey, however did you get the peaceful hearty fatteners into such a warlike frame of mind? I only tapped their barometer, moaned the poor hemlin, and it sank. Try to take the nasty creatures away, dear Snufkin. I must think for a bit, said Snufkin. The hearty fatteners heard nothing of these remarks because they hadn't any ears. After a time, the hemulin shouted, Think quickly, Snufkin, I'm beginning to slip down. Listen, said Snufkin, do you remember the time when those voles came into the garden? Moby Papa dug a lot of poles into the ground and he put windmills on them. And when the wheels went round, the earth shook so much that the voles were nervous and they gave up. Your stories are always very interesting, said the Hemulin bitterly, but I can't understand what they have to do with my sad predicament. A good deal, said Snufkin. Now you see, the Hattie Fatners can neither talk nor hear, and they see very badly, but they do feel extremely well. Try to jerk the pole backwards and forwards. The Hattie Fatners will feel it in the ground and be frightened. It goes right up into their tummies, you see. They're, they're kind of like wireless sets. The Hemulin tried to swing to and fro on the pole. I'm falling down! He burst out in alarm. Faster, faster, said Snufkin. Tiny, tiny little movements. And and then the Hemulin managed a few more desperate rocks. And then the Hattie Fatners began to feel uncomfortable in the soles of their feet. And they began to rustle and move anxiously about. And the next minute, just as the voles had done, they took to their heels and ran. In a couple of seconds, the glade was empty. Snufkin felt them against his legs as they scattered into the wood and they stung him rather like nettles. The Hemulin slid down into the grass, completely exhausted. Oh, he moaned, there has never been anything but trouble and danger since I came into the Moomin family. Do calm yourself, Hemul, said Snufkin. After all, we've been pretty lucky. Wretched, hatty creatures, grumbled the book of Hemulin. I shall take their barometer with me anyhow to punish them. Better let it be, warned Snufkin. But the Hemulin unhooked the big shiny barometer from the pole and he stuck it triumphantly under his arm. Now we'll go back to the others, he said. I'm awfully hungry. When they arrived, all the others were eating pancakes and tunny fish, which the Moomin Papa had caught in the sea. Hi, cried Moomin Troll. We've been round the whole island. On the further side, there's a dreadful wild cliff that goes right down into the sea. And we saw a mass of hatty fatness, Sniff told them. At least a hundred. Don't mention those creatures again, said the Hemulin with deep feeling. I can't stand it. But here, come and see my war trophy. And he proudly put the barometer in the middle of the tablecloth. Oh, so bright and beautiful, exclaimed the snork maiden. Is it a clock? No, it's a barometer, said the Moomin Papa. It tells you if the weather will be fine or stormy. Sometimes it's quite right. He tapped the barometer. Then he put his face into a serious crease and said, It is stormy. A big storm? asked Sniff anxiously. Look for yourself, replied Moomin Papa. The barometer points to zero, zero, and if that is the lowest a barometer can point to, if it isn't fooling us. But it certainly didn't look as if it were fooling. The golden mist had thickened to a yellow-grey fog, and out on the horizon the sea was strangely black. We must go home, said the snork. Oh, not yet, begged the snork maiden. We haven't had time to explore the cliff on the other side properly. We haven't even bathed. We can wait a little and see what happens, can't we? said Moomin Troll. It would be such a pity to go home when we've just discovered this island. But if there's a storm, we shouldn't be able to go at all, said the Snork, rightly. That would be wonderful, burst out Sniff. We could stay here for ever and ever. Quiet, children, I must think, said Moomin Papa. He went down to the beach, sniffed the air, turned his head in all directions and wrinkled his forehead. There was a rumble in the distance. Thunder, said Sniff. Ooh, how awful. Over the horizon loomed a threatening bank of cloud. It was dark blue and drove little light puffy clouds in front of it. Now and then a great flash of lightning lit up the sea. 
We stay, decided Moomin Papa. The whole night, squeaked Sniff. I think so, Moomin Papa replied. Hurry up now and build a house, as the rain will come soon. The adventure was dragged high up onto the sand, and on the edge of the wood they quickly made a house with a sail and some blankets. And Moomin Mama filled up the gaps with moss, and the snork dug a ditch around it so the rainwater would have somewhere to go. Everybody ran to and fro, putting their things safely under cover, while the thunder rolled nearer and a little wind came sighing anxiously through the trees. I'll go and see what the weather's like out on the point, said Snuffkin. Pulling his hat firmly down over his ears, he set off. Alone and happy, he ran out to the furthermost point of rock and put his back against the large boulder. The sea had changed. It was dark green now, with white horses. and The rocks shone yellow like phosphorus. Rumbling solemnly, the thunderstorm came up from the south. It spread its black sail over the sea. It spread over half the sky, and the lightning flashed with an ominous glint. It's coming right over the island, thought Snufkin, with a thrill of joy and excitement. He stood facing the storm as it advanced over the sea. Suddenly he saw a small black rider on something black, like a horse with short legs. Only for a moment were they visible against the creamy white crest of the cloud back. The rider's cloak billowed out like a wing. They rose higher, and then they were lost in a blinding network of lightning. The clouds obscured the sun. Rain was driving like a grey curtain over the sea. I have seen the hobgoblin, thought Snufkin. It must have been the hobgoblin and his black panther. They really exist. They're not just in an old fairy tale. Snufkin turned and skipped back over the stones. He reached the tent just in time. The heavy drops of rain were already hitting the sailcloth and it was being whipped about in the wind. Sniff had rolled himself completely in a blanket as he was rather afraid of thunder and the others sat hunched up next to each other. The tent smelt strongly of the Hemilin's botanical specimens. And now there was a terrific clap of thunder right over their heads and their little refuge was lit again and again by flashes of white light. Here's a lovely picture of Snufkin running back to the tent as the storm hits. A look at that. Wouldn't you like a print of that on your wall, people? Beautiful work. The thunder rumbled around the sky like a great train, while the sea hurled its biggest waves against Lonely Island. Oh, what a blessing we aren't on the sea, said Moomin Mama. Dear me, what weather. The snork maiden put a trembling paw in Moomin Trolls. He felt very protecting and manly. Sniff lay under his blanket and screamed. Now it's right over us, said Moomin Papa, and that moment a giant flash of lightning lit up the island, followed by a rending crash. That struck something, said the snork. It really was a bit too much. The hemulin sat holding his head. Trouble, always trouble, he muttered. And now it began to move off to the south. The thunderclaps got further and further away. The lightning became fainter. At last there was only the rustle of the rain and the sound of the sea as it broke on the shore. I won't tell them about the hobgoblin yet, thought Snufkin. They're scared enough as it is. You can come out now, Sniff, said Snufkin. It's all over. Sniff disentangled himself from the blanket, yawned, scratched his ear. He was a bit embarrassed now because he'd made such a fuss. What's the time? he asked. Nearly eight, answered the Snork. Then I think we'll go and lie down, said Moomin Mama. All this has been very disturbing. But wouldn't it be exciting to find out what the lightning struck, said Moomin Troll. In the morning, dear, said his mother. In the morning we'll explore everything and have a bathe. Now the island is wet and grey and unpleasant. She tucked them up and then she went to sleep herself with her handbag under her pillow. Outside, the storm redoubled its fury. The voice of the waves was now mixed with strange sounds, laughter, running feet, and the clanging of great bells far out to sea. Snufkin lay still and listened, dreaming and remembering his trip around the world. Soon I must set out again, he thought. But not yet. That's the end of chapter three for you.
well I won't read you anymore but I'm going to show you a picture for the chapter 4 just to get you excited for it here's the picture for chapter 4 look you can see the Hattie Fatners and you can see Moomin Troll still under his blanket and there's Snufkin I wonder what's going to happen until I read you that have a lovely time be good look after each other stay home and stay safe and I will see you soon everybody bye